might tell us not to worry, but I am worried. How can we have any confidence that the business plans and network engineering are not going to stifle our online freedom? You know, history is pretty clear when you look back over it. That if a company or an enterprise has the technological capability to exercise control, and they have a financial incentive to do so, it's pretty darn sure that somebody's going to give it a try to take this power and opportunity and make it work to their own advantage. And the danger to our interconnected and interdependent internet, the danger to America, is just too great to ignore that threat. Tim Wu, the uh, chairman of Free Press, is the author of a wonderful new book that I recommend to you called The Master Switch, which relates in compelling detail how other generations of information infrastructure, radio, film, television, cable, all started out promising new freedom and unlimited freedom, and all was seen to end up closed, consolidated, and far, far short of their potential to do good. And we don't need to travel down, down that road again with the internet, but there is, unfortunately, already too much evidence that maybe we're doing just exactly that. Look over the history. Now, broadcasters said, just give us a ton of free spectrum. And we did, it worth hundreds of billions of dollars, as it turned out. And they said the airways would always serve the people first, always serve the local diverse programming reflective of our communities across America. And you saw what too often happened there. Then cable came along and said they would fill the holes in the road that broadcasting had ended up creating. And you know what happened there when you look at the programs you get, and worse yet, the bills you get in the mail every month. <laughs> so in both cases, we were too quick to take their word. And what happened was that in less than a ge a, one generation, a media landscape that should have been moving toward more diversity, more localism, and more competition was transformed into a market controlled by a few players, too often providing little more than infotainment, canned music, and program homogenization. Newsrooms were shuttered, reporters were fired, and investigating journalism has just about become an endangered species. The apologist told us this was the natural result of changes in technologies and markets. Things would all work out fine in the world of new media if we just looked the other way for a little while longer. But the facts told another story. The huge debts that these mega companies took on to curry favor with investors and hedge fund operators overwhelmed broadcaster obligations to be good stewards of the public airwaves. The public's right to know got lost in this frenzy of financial hyper speculation. Now, I want to be fair here and not pin it all on speculators or even on media companies. In fact, there are many broadcasters, particularly those of the smaller independent variety, who do an excellent job against steep odds, serving the public interest and informing their communities. The problem is we, and by we I mean mostly the Federal Communications Commission where I work, have made it awfully difficult for such broadcasters to survive in this newly consolidated environment. First, we blessed and facilitated ever more of that industry consolidation by loosening our ownership rules so that fewer and fewer media giants could buy up more and more outlets. And then to further advance the interests of a powerful few over the citizens, the commission moved away from any real oversight of our media infrastructure by wiping the slate clean of the public interest guidelines that generations of consumers and advocates like the folks sponsoring this affair tonight had managed to put in place against powerful industry opposition. And I'm talking about things like guidelines for providing real local news and reflecting the ethnic and cultural diversity of communities of license and limiting commercials and talking with listeners and viewers about the kinds of programming they really want. All of that's gone. It began in 1980 when they sent us a chairman of the FCC who said, you know, Television set is really nothing but a toaster with pictures. This is an exact quotation. <laughs> and that's how they proceeded to exercise the public interest oversight 
of this important information infrastructure. So now the big internet service providers are giving us the same pitch. Don't worry, be happy. We would never, ever compromise the openness of the internet. And after what happened to radio and TV, and after what happened to cable, do you think we should take their word? No. no. I don't think so. Now, today the danger is that big business will put us on the road to the cannibalization and the cableization and the consolidation of broadband and the internet. And they've already made tremendous headway on their agenda, especially at the FCC. As with those earlier generations of uh, uh, media, radio, and TV, industry lobbyists once again found an all too compliant FCC to help them do their work. Here's the idea, they told the Commission, their allies at the Commission. We don't want this next generation of telecommunications to be saddled with all of those protections that consumers and advocates have fought so hard for over so many years uh, as regards plain old telephone service, things like protecting privacy and supporting public safety and ensuring just and reasonable and comparable rates and services across the country, no matter where you live. So, as the representative said, they said, why, why not just take access to broadband out of that part of the statute where these requirements hold sway and put them in this kind of never-never land called Title I where everything is very ambiguous, nothing very much is really required, and whenever you try to do something, you're going to be taken to court and contested uh, by industry. And our two previous FCC commissions said, oh, that sounds good, done deal, let's do that. We'll call access to the Internet and Information Service instead of telecommunications. We won't have to worry about all those requirements, let the market work its wonders, and presto, the deed was done. They moved it out of any meaningful oversight, and away went all of those safeguards that accompanied plain old telephone service. They did it over my strong objection and those of my friend and then colleague, Jonathan Adelstein. And you know, by the way, no, no other country in the world I've asked this question, has any other country gone through this semantic uh, ledger domain of uh, information services and telecommunication services? And they would call it up Professor Bank or Harvard University who knows all about this stuff. I said, do you ever hear anybody doing that? He said, I've never heard of anything like that. Well, our job now is to correct uh, course by reclassifying broadband as the telecommunications service it is. It's not very hard, it's like calling an apple an apple, you know? <laughs> so that we can protect consumers against discrimination and protect them against the dangers of a privatized internet. That does not mean that every regulation that applied to a dial telephone should apply to access to the internet, but it does mean that someone has the authority to make sure our telecommunications infrastructure truly serves the people.